Uh, seven questions, I think, from last semester's final. Bring that on Tuesday with you. And today, we will spend a little time at the end looking at that homework 10 together. Homework 10 is due next Tuesday at 5 o'clock, but it's just four questions, and we'll talk through three of them. Your exam is a week from today, the 21st at night. And if you're going to be doing office hours next week, there'll be a new schedule being available. I just received it today, so I will take a look at it and get it up on C-Tools for you. Do you have a question or a comment? So far, it's quiet in the background. We've got a phone number to call if it gets too noisy now. So there's where you go next Thursday night. Last lecture on Tuesday will be review. So there's no out of class review. That exam can cover any material from the semester, but you know what's going to be on there for sure. A regression problem, a one way ANOVA problem, and at least one or two chi squared questions too, because that's what we're doing in the later material. I'm hearing a lot of talking. If you have a question, I'll certainly take it, but we have started. Any questions or comments at all? All right. We have a little more chi-squared to do together. I wanted to recap with you the test of homogeneity background, because that's the last example we went through. So homogeneity on page 214 is the summary. We did an example looking at ice cream preference last time. This ice cream preference seemed to be the same for boys versus girls in preschool. The test of homogeneity involves having two or more populations. And you've taken a random sample, independent random samples from each. You've measured one response, and that response, though, is either categorical or maybe very discrete with only a few outcomes. And you're interested in learning whether or not the model for that response, that probability distribution, is the same for your populations. That's your H naught. We mentioned that the null hypothesis can be stated in words. Here's a very generic way to state it. I would expect you to put it in the context of the problem a little bit in terms of what is the response. Ice cream preference was the one we had last time. If you have populations identified, boys versus girls, to state that. And then the alternative is just the model's not the same, not H naught. Your yellow card has this information. It gives you the test statistic formula, which is the same for all three chi-squared tests. It tells you how to calculate those expected counts with that cross product rule. Row total, column total, multiplied on top, overall total on the bottom. And then it does remind you, so you don't have to remember, what the degrees of freedom are. It's based on the dimension of the table. Number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Because you don't need to have all the probabilities known for all the rows, just all but one of them. Same with the columns. All right, we're going to take a look at two more examples here. We'll come back to the one on this page, what is your decision. Let's try running through the SPSS output example. That starts on page 215. So here's one where the amount of work you have to do for calculations will be less because a lot of it's done for you. The background, trying to learn about this chickenpox vaccine and if it really would help to stop shingles. A trial was conducted where you had 420 subjects. They were randomly assigned to one of the other, one of two treatment groups. They either got the actual vaccine or they got a placebo vaccine. So right there, the random assignment tells you you have two samples that are both independent and not matched or paired. 
It turns out how many people actually got the vaccine. Look at your table of counts here. The vaccine was actually given to 230 out of the 420, and there were 190 that ended up getting the placebo vaccine. So we would actually know these totals in advance even before we measured their swelling at the site of the injection. That's the main side effect that we're interested in. Did they have major, minor, or no swelling? Well, you do have a clue right there that it's a chi-square test that you'll be doing. There are three chi-square tests that we are learning, goodness of fit, homogeneity, and the test of independence. Take a look at the statement in part A, and it should tell you what kind of tests you'd like to perform here. You want to assess if the distribution of your response, swelling status, is the same for your two treatment populations. So we're asking you to do what test? It falls under what we just summarized. It is the chi-squared test of homogeneity. The way the questions asked here tells you that. Also by the design of the study, you have two treatment populations, independent samples from each because of the randomization. You're measuring one variable, the response is their swelling status, major, minor, or none, and you want to know if the model for that discrete categorical variable is the same for your two populations. So it's a chi-square test of homogeneity. All right, here's how we can bring in some exam one material into a chi-squared problem. We can have you work with that two-way table of counts and just have you find some probabilities. We had you do that back in exam one, chapter seven it would be. So here are our table of counts. We're just asked to use the data to come up with a percent or a proportion or probability. In this case, look at those who actually got the vaccine among those with the actual vaccine what percent had major swelling? So what am I going to do? Major swelling is this first row. I want to look at those who had the actual vaccine, so I want to focus on that first row and look at that first column of information. So how many had the actual vaccine again? 230. And I want the percent who had major swelling, so what am I going to put on top? The 54. 54 had major swelling out of the 230. 54 out of 230 is a little more than 20%. We were asked for a percentage, so we'll write it as a percent. But would you be able to even identify what probability you just found there using these results with some events inside? You found the probability of seeing what outcome? Major swelling, given or conditional on, they actually had the vaccine. You found a conditional probability. This rate should be very close to the rate for the placebo group if there's really no difference. So they ask you in part C to find the same kind of conditional rate percentage for the other treatment group. So out of the 190 that had the placebo vaccine, let's work out how many there had major swelling. It was only nine, or 16. 16 out of 190, though, was a much smaller percent. There's another conditional probability of seeing major swelling still, given they had the placebo. Now these two rates in any data set won't be exactly the same, but are they close enough to say the models are basically the same or are they looking quite different? 8% versus 23%, they start to look a little bit different. Those rates should be the same or close to the same if really the distribution underlying them does not depend on the treatment. In D, they say, let's assume that the distribution is the same. And then let's find out how many of those vaccinated subjects would you have expected to have major swelling. 
What's a shorthand phrase for this long part at the beginning here? If H naught's true, assuming H naught's true, find for me an expected count. Now I have 54 that actually observed to be major swelling in that vaccinated group, but I want to know how many would you have expected to be there under the model that really there's no difference. So I'm finding one expected count out of the six that you could be asked to find to do a chi-squared problem here. So I need the expected count for that first cell. What's the rule again? It's called the cross product rule. You take the row total, you multiply by the column total, and divide by the overall total. You're taking the 70 people that had major swelling and breaking it up into the right ratio based on the sizes of the two samples. And you turn out to get that you would have expected only about 38. 38.33. And you're not going to round and say, oh, about 38 on that final answer line. You're right, 38.33. Because that is the expected count, what you'd expect on average if the study were repeated many times with these same sample sizes. So there's one of the six expected counts that you would need to actually find if you were going to do the chi-square test yourself. Here's where I'm just having you find one of them but not needing to find all of them even to do part E because you have some nice output here that's done the test for you. But there's one. We're asked to conduct the test to see if the distribution is the same for our two treatments by reporting the test statistic value and the p-value. Now we know our test statistic value is going to be an x squared value, right? That's the notation for our, our test statistic. And I will have students on an exam actually calculate that test statistic. They'll find all six expected counts, work out that test statistic formula just to show me that it's one of the numbers in that chart. But we need to know which number it is. Now, module number 10 in your SPSS workbook, we didn't have a lab next week to go through that. So that module in full with solutions is up on C-Tools. So you can look at it and try any of those chi-squared problems out. And if you were to look through it, you would learn that the test statistic that we have been using is called the Pearson chi-squared test statistic. Carl Pearson's the statistician that came up with this idea. And so our test statistic values is 18. There are other versions of a test statistic that test different hypotheses with a two-way table that those other rows are providing for us. Can you confirm the degrees of freedom of two? Does that make sense with the dimensions of our table? Our table is a two by three table. So we have two rows and three columns. R minus 1 times C minus 1. So we have two degrees of freedom. And then this last column we know typically gives you your p value. There are a few hypotheses that you could end up having them be a two sided version. But our chi square test is only the one tail for the p value. And what's reported there is the one sided p value for us. So this number can directly come down, lots of zeros a very small p-value. The two-sided really applies to some of those other um, testing that can be done there, and it leaves it there as a heading, but you don't have to worry about it. In fact, I often white it out if I have you have it on an exam, so you don't have to worry about it. But we do have to use that p-value, and I need you to make a decision. I know you can make the decision, but do you know what the conclusion would be? So that's what the clicker question is that's next. Know what your decision is, whether it would be reject or fail to reject H0, and then what would that mean for what you would select to write out a nice conclusion? Does the fact that our test statistic is 18 kind of correlate with a really tiny p-value compared to the ones we've seen in the past? What am I kind of comparing 18 to? What would be the expected value of your test statistic? Remember the really cool relationship in chi-square tests? Your test statistic has a chi-square distribution under H naught. 
This would follow a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. And with a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, the balancing point, the expected value, the mean, is two. And we're out here at 18. Many standard deviations above two. Very small p-value. So with a small p-value, I know that means to reject h naught. But what does it mean then in terms of the conclusion? If you're rejecting H0, you need to know what H0 is saying and what HA is saying so you can formulate the right conclusion. <coughs> and you're doing quite well. The name of the test, test of homogeneity, is what H0 has in it that things are the same. If we are rejecting that H naught, then we indeed should say the model does not appear to be the same. Does not. You might be asked to write out the H naught. If so, in words, make sure it's about the populations that you're comparing still. Know what it means to reject in terms of a conclusion. All right, now I want you to go back to 214 and take a look at that last very short example. I'm going to let you read it and give you about a minute or two to think of it. If you need to, think of what the data would look like. What kind of table would you get if the data is described? But you're told you're doing a homogeneity test. Three populations, four possible values for your statistic or your outcome. And sort of a classic question. So you know you have a homogeneity test. It's chi-squared, it's counts. It tells you that there are three treatment populations, or three populations, and there's four possible values for your response. So this is the type of table. It could be four by three or three by four, however you put the populations versus the response. But that would be filled with counts when you have your data. If h is true, and here's that phrase again. If the distribution of your response is the same for your three populations, what's the expected value of your test statistic? So what's my test statistic again? My test statistic is this x squared, right? It would be found with those observed counts and the expected ones. But I can't compute that. I can't calculate that observed value of the test statistic. But that is my test statistic. And I want to know what's the expected value of that statistic if h naught is true. Or what's the distribution of this statistic if h naught is true. If h naught is true, this x squared follows or has, what kind of distribution are we working with now? A chi-square distribution with a certain degrees of freedom. What are the degrees of freedom? Mm -hmm. R minus 1, so I have here four rows and three columns. You could have had the opposite, but you still get the same answer of 3 times 2, or 6 degrees of freedom. So what's the answer to this question? 6. six. The degrees of freedom for your chi-square distribution play the role of the mean. They tell you what you would expect for that value of that quantity, that variable. So 
we'd expect the expected value of your x squared statistic turns out to be the degrees of freedom, 6 in this case. So what if we have a part B to this question? Part A, you told me that you would expect to see 6 on average for your test statistic if H naught's true. You do the test, your test statistic is computed, and you get 6. What are you going to decide? Are you going to stay with H naught or reject it? You just got exactly what you'd expect to see if H naught's true. So you're going to stay with H naught. And if I had said you got the value of a statistic to be 5 or 4 or anything smaller than 6, again, you're going to stay with H naught. Because what kind of values lead you to reject the null hypothesis in a chi-squared problem? Only those values that are large. Only when the distances between the observed and expected are big do you reject. So if I get 6 or anything less than 6, I know my decision. It'll be stay with H naught. If I were to get 8 or 10 or something bigger than 6, I'd have to find the p-value to know if it is extreme enough or not. Good. All right, there's our homogeneity. We have one final test to go through. It is called the test of independence. The data is going to look the same in an independence test as in a homogeneity test. You can already see the example we're going to look at on that page 216. It's a two-way table of counts. But the background to the problem is different. The question and how it's asked for the researcher's questions usually phrased a little differently too. Now we don't have two or more populations. We only have one population, one population of interest one random sample from that population. We measure two variables that happen to be discrete or categorical, and we want to know if there's an association between them, a relationship, or are they independent? So some key words, look for clues of trying to establish some association, or if there is a relationship, or the direct word of are they independent or not? So we only have one population we're studying, not two treatment groups or three treatment groups, measuring one response, but we have one population and we're measuring two variables and want to know if there's a relationship between them. Where the variables here, though, are not both quantitative, so you can't do a scatter plot and do a regression line model fit to it, perhaps, but rather you have to work through a chi-squared assessment of association. The example we're going to go through is where we have a population of factory workers trying to establish if there is a relationship between these two variables. Their smoking habit, non-smoker, moderate or heavy, and whether or not they experience hypertension. Yes or no. These are the two variables that we will simultaneously measure on each of our 180 factory workers that we've taken as a sample. So before I measure those 180 workers, the only total that I'll know for the whole table is just overall total if everybody answers everything. Whereas when we did the ice cream example, we had 75 boys and 75 girls that we knew those totals in advance. When we did the vaccine treatment, we separated the subjects into two groups. They had to be given the vaccine first before you could measure if they had swelling. So you knew those totals in advance. Let's get our row and column totals here too because we'll need them to do the actual assessment. So our non-smokers add up to 69. Our moderate smokers totaled 62. 49 is our total for the heavy. And the yes hypertension, 87 said yes. 93 said no. Because we need those to find expected counts if we're going to be doing the full test. So this is a test of independence, so let's write out our hypotheses. Again, we could use some notation where we'd have to have probabilities and the variable x versus the variable y and any combination end up being independent. Here's one example of that again. Remember the aim rule? If you had an and and they're independent, you can multiply. So this is one way of expressing that finding the probability of particular outcome on each variable together can be found by just multiplying the product of those two probabilities, but we'll just say it in words. 
And you can say it a couple different ways, but H naught should have the statement that things are independent. It's a test of independence, that's what goes into H naught. Independence means there's no association between our two variables for our population, that there's no relationship between them. So that's how we can state H naught, and H A, of course, is that there is some relationship, something going on. So we have our observed counts. We need to work out our expected counts. It's a two-way table. We've already reasoned through how to get the expected counts with the cross product rule. When you're kind of assessing that your distribution is independent of the population, so we use that same rule. So how will I find my first expected count? For that non-smoking and yes, hypertension. If H naught's true, if there's no association between these two variables, how many of the factory workers would you have expected to be non-smokers who do have hypertension? Not 21, that's the observed count, but how many would you have expected? So what do we do? 87 times 69, and then divide that by 180. And that will give you, not a whole number, it'll give you a 33. 0.35. Let's have you find one more, or think that through. How about the moderate smokers with hypertension? How many would we have expected there? Take the same 87, but now the column total is 62. And that will turn out to be a little less than 30, 29.97. Now those are the only two expected counts that you have to find the long way. Because all the rest can be found by subtraction. That's why your degrees of freedom are two. Number of rows minus one times the number of columns on You have to find two things, and once they're found, the rest are fixed. These two, though, are based on the formula. So we can find the rest by subtraction. If there's 33.35 non-smokers with hypertension, there's 35.65 left to say no hypertension. And here are the remaining ones. 32.03. And our columns now add up. Let's do our rows. We need a final 23.68 for the heavy smoking with yes, and 25.32. So there's all six expected counts. Once you have the expected counts, you need to still measure how close they are to those observed ones through your test statistic. Your x squared test statistic is the same for all chi-squared tests. You're going to always take your observed count minus the expected one, and the expected is your base. So I've written out the first term. There would be six terms altogether. With the final one looking like 19 that were observed and expected 25. Don't forget to square on top and put the expected on the bottom. You get some students forgetting the square. Our test statistic here turns out to be a bit bigger than we've seen in the past. Our last one had a large number, but this one too, 14 and a half. Now you might have to calculate one chi-squared test statistic on the exam, but I won't have you do all three. Maybe you'll have output for one of them, so you just have to pull it out and use it to make your decision. Here's our 14 and a half, and before we find the p-value, we're going to use that frame of reference one more time. 14 and a half. So do you think 14 and a half is large enough? to reject H naught. Well, to know if it's really large or not, I kind of need to know that frame of reference. I need to know what the distribution looks like for my test statistic. And it's a chi-square distribution with how many degrees of freedom did we just say? Two. It's R minus one times C minus one again, which here gives us two degrees of freedom. So let's work through that frame of reference one more time. Top of the next page.
How would you fill in the blanks? If H naught's true, if there really is no association between our two variables here, our test statistic would be expected to be about how big? About 2. The mean is the degrees of freedom. And do you remember what the standard deviation was? If you don't remember, flip over two more pages and you've got your output formula card. What the formula card looks like and look at that very bottom row. Page 220 has your output. The last row in the formula table tells you if you have a chi-squared model, your degrees of freedom are the mean and what's the variance? The variance is twice the degrees of freedom. But I want to give or take here so I better do the standard deviation. Square root of twice the degrees of freedom square root of twice 2 takes you to the square root of 4, which is back to 2 again. So if h naught's true, we would have expected a value of about 2, give or take about 2. I would really expect to see something like from 0 to 4 in that range. We're out here at 14 and a half. About how many standard deviations is our value from that mean? Well, we observed what? 14 and a half? And it is above the mean of 2. I want to know how far above the mean of 2 in standard deviation units. It's about 12 over 2 or about 6. 6.25. We're about 6 standard deviations above the mean under H0. Is that pretty far away from the mean? What you'd expect? Do you think we're going to have a big p-value here or a small one? Chi-squared, you're way out here, way above the mean, and we're doing that little tail area over here. It's pretty small. But here is just looking at how far away we are. What did we just calculate here? This is called a z-score, standard score. You can always look at how far away you are from the mean in standard units, as long as you have the mean and standard deviation to do that with. I'm not having you do a Z test here, but I'm looking at how unusual my test statistic is. So let's have you find the p-value one more time. Our observed test statistic is that 14 and a half. We have two degrees of freedom. You've got a partial table back on page 206 to use if you need to. Draw me a nice picture of the p-value and find the bounds. So then you can click in your conclusion in just a moment. Is our p-value pretty small? How small can you say? It's even less than 0, 0, 001. We're off the chart. The largest test statistic value that's provided is a 13.82, and that already has only 0.1% in its upper tail. Our p-value is less than that. If you want to bound completely on each side, it's bigger than 0, but less than 0, 0.001. 
So it's pretty small. Are we statistically significant at a 1% level? Yeah. Are p-values less than 1%? Which conclusion then is the right one to say here? Now we wrote out the null hypothesis. It was written for us on page 216. It is the test of independence. So think of the name of the test tells you what H0 is saying. H0 should say things are independent, these variables. And what did we just decide about that H0? We just rejected it of our small p-value. Many are picking the correct A, that there is an association then, apparently, based on our data. There seems to be something going on. H0 is that they're independent. We rejected that, so there seems to be some dependency. There seems to be some association between our two variables and label them, give me those names, for the population the population of factory workers represented by our sample. So that's a good way to write out the conclusion. We've established this at a 1% level. We did the test at a 1% or a 5% and we make the same decision. Good. The difference between these two tests, and you do them the same, you're going to pull off the same chi-squared test statistic from the output. It's going to look the same with a two-way table of counts, but the underlying assumptions are different. In independence, there's only one population one random sample, and you've measured two things, two variables, that you want to know if there's a relationship between them. Homogeneity requires that you have two or more populations, each having a random sample from them that are independent. And you've only measured one response, that you want to know if its model is the same for your populations. You can kind of think of that as being, does the model depend on which population you're from? That's why there is that link and why they're done the same way. You're looking to see if there's a dependency of the model on the population. But it is called a different test name because it has different assumptions behind it. The homogeneity test would fall under ANOVA. But now you don't have quantitative data, you've got categorical. ANOVA let us compare populations, but we had to have a quantitative response with means. Homogeneity lets you compare populations when all you have is categorical counts. Whereas this technique we just did, the independence, would fall under regression. Regression required two quantitative variables to see if there's a relationship. The chi-score test of independence lets you do a relationship assessment if those two variables are categorical instead. All right. There is one final question that we could go through, but I have posted that already on CTOOL. But just look at the background. Can you see why it's going to be a test of independence? We have one random sample of 150 women. They were asked to answer the question, are you satisfied with your appearance? And give your age by an age category. And the first question that you're asked is to name the test, the test that would be appropriate if you want to know if there's a relationship between age group and appearance chi-square test of independence. So it's very similar to the one we just did with the um, vaccine and placebo vaccine. Try that one out on your own. A little different, part C, but you still pull off your same Pearson chi-square test statistic. Yellow cards on page 220. So you don't have everything there. You don't have the conditions. You don't have what H0 explicitly looks like. And notice that the test of independence and homogeneity are under the same column. Because what we're giving you there is common between those two. Same test statistic formula, same expected counts, same degrees of freedom. So we can keep them together, but they are two separate tests. Then this last phrase is your nice frame of reference. 
It tells you that if you have something that follows a chi-squared model, and you know its degrees of freedom, well, then you know what to expect for that something, the degrees of freedom. You know what the variance will be for that random quantity, twice the degrees of freedom, so you can find the standard deviation. All right, I've got a little homework 10 help. What we thought, I thought we would do is look at the background of each of the questions and make sure we can at least know which of the chi-square tests we're doing there. So if you haven't printed it out, that's fine. I've got the questions here. This is the first one out of four. Let's take a look at the background. Question number one. They state that on a typical day, the proportion of students who drive to campus is 30%. The proportion who take a bike, ride a bike, is 60%. And the remaining 10% come in some other way, walking, whatever, maybe by bus, get a ride. There's this spare the air day where they're asking people to not drive to campus. And they want to know on that particular day does it look like the proportions for how they got to campus differed from this standard model, this normal model? A random sample of 300 students for that particular day were asked how they got to campus, and we've got those counts right here. So what does it already look like to you? It's a one-way table of counts, not a two-way table. You've got one random sample of 300 students. You've measured one variable, how did you get to campus? which is categorical, and you've got a standard model, a norm model that's typical that you want to compare your results to to see whether it fits well or not. It is what kind of test? A chi-squared goodness of fit. Goodness of fit. Would you be able to write out H naught? Remember how an H naught looks like in a goodness of fit problem? Well, Usually we have proportions or probabilities in H0, and they're usually a P1, a P2, a P3, and so on. So I'm just going to designate those three outcomes as 1, 2, and 3 in that order so that I could write it that way. And what would I write here? Does P1 equal 80? Does P1 equal 80 out of 300? Or P1 is what? What am I testing here? This is the standard model that we want to see whether things differed from that norm. So P1 would be 0.3. And the proportion who would ride their bike, if it were a typical day, would be 0.6. And the final proportion who get to school in some other way would be 0.1. I've specified the model for you that I want to compare the data to. Now I could have said equally likely, you know, if the model was we want to see if there is any difference from the equally likely model, then what would each of those probabilities have been? If there were three of them, they would each have to be one third. Mm -hmm. But we have the model we specified. So how will you find expected counts? These are the observed counts. How many would you have expected to drive to campus if that model H0 is really true? Well, 30%. 30% of 300. N times P is your formula that it states. So you have to find the three expected counts. You have to calculate your test statistic. What degrees of freedom will you be using for that test statistic here? It says K minus 1 on your formula card. What's K? It's how many categories you have. Drive, bike, or other, so it's 3 minus 1 or 2. So this is one where you do have to actually compute the statistics, so you'll have to find the expected counts for me first and work them out to get the chi-square test statistic. Give me a p-value range and write up a conclusion in the context of the problem. That's number one. Kind of fits with the p example we did, Mendel p experiment, or the four toll booth. Question number two is about eating healthy. They took a random sample of 950 adults 
asking him, how much effort do you make on eating a healthy diet? But they broke up the results by gender to be able to compare men versus women. Very serious about it, somewhat serious, don't really try. Are the possibilities for how much effort do you make? And we have the counts. This is a two-way table, so it's one of the other two. It's either homogeneity or independence. With what is asked, which is in part A, if we want to see If the distribution for our response is the same for our population of men versus our population of women, we would be doing what kind of test? Test of? Not good as the fit because it's two-way table. Homogeneity or independence, please? Homogeneity. Now, how you do the test after this, after you stated the H0, is the same. And you are asked to work out an expected count. You're asked to work out the expected value of your test statistic. We've done that now a couple times. And you're given the chi-squared output. We even just focus on the Pearson chi-squared statistic for you. So you're reporting the test statistic value. You do ask here to upload a nice picture. We've drawn some nice pictures now together, the p-value. You need to draw one and upload it for that problem. So plan to spend the time to do that so you can get that upload in there and earn those couple of points. Test of homogeneity. Good. How about question three? Looking at the relationship between personality type and primary color preference. Red, green, or blue are the three primary colors, personality types, introverted versus extroverted. We've got a survey of 550 people. We measured these two variables to try to learn if primary color preference is associated with personality type or not. What's the test here? Keyword, are things associated? So it's a test of independence. Now this one, you have to find all six expected counts. You have to state the H0 correctly. When you state H0, go back to the notes that we have. Make sure it's about the population and about your two variables by name in there. You find all six expected counts by the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 notation there to denote them. But we do give you the test statistic again to work through. And we ask you a couple other questions regarding that. And then the last one is simply a name that test, and I'll let you do that one on your own. So that's homework 10. Now what I have is a final name that scenario though that's not on your homework to try. Take another five to ten minutes and then we'll be done for today. Okay? Here's a nice chart. It's up on C tools for you. Everything that's in bold is something you've done in this class. The things that are in italics are things we didn't get to. It lays it out by having the rows designating what kind of data you have. Is it quantitative or categorical? Quantitative at the top, categorical at the bottom. The quantitative ones along the top are all about means. Those tests that we did about means always required normality for your population model, for your response. Down at the other end, categorical, we first did proportions, P, and P1 minus P2. But then we recently put in these chi-score tests that allow us to do more than just yes and no answers for categorical data. And we even had that binomial test listed there, which we learned for small samples. The tests that are in the middle, we've learned a few by name. We did mention Mood's median test. We mentioned Kruskal-Wallis when we talked about ANOVA and said if you can't assume normality and you don't have large enough sample sizes to use that CLT, there are some of these non-parametric techniques that fall in between. So here are the names of them. And I've had some students with their honors work come back and say, here's what I've got for data. Here's my QQ plots. I'm in trouble here. I can't use a normal model. And we end up having to show them one of those non-parametric tests to use instead. The chi-square test of symmetry we didn't get to. 
It is the nice one to compare befores and afters when it's categorical. Do you favor or oppose before you see this video? Do you favor or oppose the issue now after you see the video? Categorical data, paired data. So I've got this list of questions that we've always talked through. You know, things to ask yourself. Look at the problem. Is it one population, two? Do I have more than two? How many variables am I measuring? What kind of variables are they? Categorical or quantitative? And sometimes you have to distinguish between paired and independent, right? So I've got three final slides. They're three clicker questions. They're about the last techniques we just did that are new. And see if you can pick the right technique for a last little review. It continues with, was it Bobby and Barney, the bakers of the cookies? So let's see how you'll do. So they're making cookies, and they want them to be good cookies. Obviously, the flour that you put in the mix will have something to do, perhaps, with the moisture of the cookie. Is there a relationship between the amount of flour used in the mix and the cookie moisture content measured in percent? How moist is the cookie in a certain percent scale? Now I can. If you look at some of those old finals, you will see often the last page is a nice long name that scenario. Any of the techniques that I haven't already asked you about would definitely be there, along with maybe a few others. Matching. Okay. You're all over the place. We've got a few that are prominent and a couple that are not, but everyone's got an answer for everything. Looks like it's B or D. What makes sense here? You picked up on the word relationship, right? And relationship means either regression or test of independence. But what kind of variables do we have here? Amount of flour in the mix. Quantitative. Can you have two cups? Can you have 2.25 cups? Can you have 2.5 cups? Can you have Lots of different values. And the percent moisture content, percent, from 0 to 100%. So both of these variables are quantitative. So what would be your first choice of a technique, rather than having to go to one that would have less power? Linear regression. I would first want to make a scatter plot. How much flour? Moisture content would probably be your dependent variable. The moisture depends on the amount of flour going in the mix. And see if I could do a linear model so that I could then estimate the percent moisture for any amount of flour I end up putting in. Now, you could always take data that's quantitative and break it into classes. Moisture content, very moist, moderate amount, and dry. You could do that, cut it into segments, but why go to learning more, less about your data and go to a categorical measurement when you have the quantitative one? Those techniques lose power as you go from the top to the bottom in that table. All right, linear regression. Do you know how to write out the linear model? Do you know the assumptions, those four technical assumptions in regression? What kind of graphs you would look at? What do you look for in a residual plot and things like that? There'll be a nice long regression problem on the final. Is there an association? Oops, I forgot to stop. Is there an association between the type of flour that's used and the texture of the cookie? There you go. Texture of the cookie is chewy or crispy. Type of flour used is all purpose, whole wheat or cake. Now you know which one, don't you? The two key words, relationship or association, but now this one has to be D. Chi-squared test of independence. I could ask you, if there really is no association between these two variables, what would you expect your test statistic value to be? If there really is no relationship between the two variables, what would you expect for the value of your test statistic? Type of flower, three categories. T 
type of texture to, so three by two table, so how many degrees of freedom? Two. Two would be your expected value. And our final one. How about the type of flower being used again? Does it make a difference in terms of the average moisture content of our cookies? Still got these three types of flour. Going to make cookies with each type. Going to measure the percent moisture content for each of those cookies of each of those types. So I have the all purpose flour, and here's some cookies made that way with their percent moisture content. Next type of bear flour. Wanting to know if it makes a difference to the average moisture content. What do you think, guys? What's your data going to look like? All-purpose flour. Here's some measurements of cookies made that way. Those are percentages that I'm measuring. And then I've got whole wheat flour and some measurements there. And I've got some cookies made with the cake flour instead. Each of these sets of data are numerical. I will be calculating these sample means to see whether there's a difference between those average percent moisture content. So even though it's percent being measured, that first cookie might have a 62% as its answer. And that next cookie under the all-purpose might be 71%. These are the percentage of moisture within that cookie as a measure of moisture level. Moisture levels being measured. So what type of technique now? More of you changed your answer to the right one, A. One way ANOVA, three, very, three different treatments, three different populations comparing three means. There will be a one way ANOVA problem on your exam. All right, one lecture left. Have a good weekend. Bring that review on Tuesday. That's what I hope I'll be doing in the summer. Can't wait. <laughs>